Wes Scantlin has been one of the most controversial figures in America's loaded hard rock industry. He is the frontman of a band many would be familiar with called Puddle of Mud. The name can trigger bad experiences for some concert goers. This was because Scantlin was known for poor stage performances that included meltdowns, false accusations, you stole, this motherfucker stole my fucking house, lip syncing, and sudden cancellations. Wes's flight still has not landed. Of course. Of course. Who's shocked in this crowd tonight? Within 10 years, the band became one of the most up and coming into a disaster waiting to happen. My neighbor vandalized my house, so I had to take action. Wes Scantlin pioneered the band to its success thanks to a mixtape falling into the hands of Limp Bizkit. Puddle of Mud was also considered a post-grunge band that succeeded with hit tracks such as Famous, featured in SmackDown vs. Raw 2008. Numerous other singles were used by WWE in many of their pay-per-views, but this would only plateau the band's success. Sale-wise, Puddle of Mud's music career peaked with their 2001 album Come Clean, which reached triple platinum, thus sparking their success. Alright, so apologies for this project to be very long, it, it, is a very, it was a very long project. My main goal throughout this entire project was to answer a very important question to me. Is Wes Scantlin as bad as people say he is? I remember being at shows and hearing through my friends and other random people about the very flaky disrespectful acts of Wes Scantlin, and I could only think negative of the man. I want to take that disdain that I have for him and put it at the side for this project. As time went by, I realized something very special about this project. There are a lot of different perspectives of how people see Wes Scantlin. The perspectives on Wes Scantlin are completely divided in seeing him as either a talented musician or an egotistical maniac. Today I want to present to you guys a timeline of Wes Scantlin, his ego trips, insecurities, and attention-seeking attitude that led this artist into hot water following the release of their album Come Clean. I will also be talking about the band's history and going through each individual individual album as I purchased all but one of them. If you are interested in hearing about the specific incidents committed by Wes Scantlin, I recommend going to this part in the video. Typically, a lot of the really crazy Wes Scantlin stuff did not happen until 2015, 2016. And by that point, everything was going pretty well for Wes. He was relatively successful in rock music, hitting numerous Song of the Year awards. But what changed? Perhaps Wes Scantlin was facing a battle of addiction that was enabled by his rock and roll lifestyle. Or what if he deflected negatively to the drama and the criticism found within his life? But it was clear, however, that a major source of these issues had to do with public intoxication in regards to alcohol. And don't get me wrong, there are some pretty fucked up acts committed by Wes over the years that many would see as unjustifiable. However, Wes's journey tells a story. A story about addiction, denial, and vulgarity that contributed to a negative reflection of criticism and the people wielding it. I really worked hard on this project and tried to see many different perspectives. So I hope you guys enjoy. I'm going to glaze over the early years of the band, but really the key facts you need to know before we jump to 1994 is this. Wes was born on June 9th, 1972 in St. Joseph, Missouri, just outside of Kansas City. Scantlin formed Puddle of Mud in 1991. They got their name after the Missouri River flooded their practice space and left the floor a big puddle of mud. The original members of Puddle of Mud were Sean Salmon on bass, Kenny Burkip on drums, and and Jimmy Allen, who was the lead guitarist. Note, I'm no music major, however, I'm still a very passionate music fan, so I only know a little bit about music theory, but not a whole lot. Also, music is very subjective, so apologies ahead if you don't agree with my thoughts on certain bands or songs. Puddle of Mud's first record was an EP published by VR Records. The band wrote seven songs on the album. It was available on both CD and cassette. Puddle of Mud's 1994 EP Stuck holds a rather strong grunge vibe with its use of distorted guitar. The album cover displays four peculiar beings. I'm not really 100% sure what these characters represent, but it surely gives off a vibe that it could have something to do with each individual bandmate. The back would display a fifth entity that looks like an upside down ghost. The EP I ordered arrived damaged on the top left corner. However, I want to give this man a special thanks. Guitars, 99 on eBay. 
the dude sent me two additional records of guitarist Jimmy Allen's post-Mud projects. Thanks, mate. The lyric book looks amateur, but it's understandable because they were a tiny indie band at this point. The first track, You Don't Know, starts the song off with an immediate guitar riff. that welcomes the listener with influences of Butthole Surfers, Nirvana, and Alice in Chains just all melting into Wes's slightly awkward voice. This album surprised me with the amount of talent these original four possessed. Jimmy Allen gets his own solo in songs like Harassed, about 13 minutes into the album. Poke Out My Eyes was another great track. It just possesses a lot of energy that just makes me crave a pit. The rest of the band is giving 110%, resulting in the music music to synergize with Wes's slightly squawking voice. All seven tracks have something different on the table that really made Puddle of Mud stand out to me. This to me was the purest form of the band. I've listened to this EP several times and I still greatly enjoy it. The lyrics in Puddle of Mud expresses Wes's struggle of alienation, jealousy, and of course addiction. But before we dive into that, we need to talk about this man's dedication. Wes had a dream, and he would do anything to achieve that dream. Wes would eagerly pass around his demo tapes in hopes of one day one of them will make a big break for him. One example being at a Stone Temple Pilots concert where he allegedly crawled through 400 yards of bush to get backstage only to be thrown out by security. So on June 5th, 2003, the Pitch KC did an interview with ex-guitarist Jimmy Allen following his departure in 1997. Allen split publishing rights half and half with Scantlin. Jimmy Allen would end up forming the unsigned band Cutout and actually got the better end of the stick compared to the rest of the bandmates. We will briefly go back into this source further down the road. Honestly, what makes this album decent is the audio balancing between Wes's voice and the instruments themselves. The guitar occasionally explores new chords, and the drummer assists this with its intensity in tracks like Nobody Told Me. The album to me is in a clear attempt at being grunge. One of the most well-known Scantlin facts is his love for Nirvana. This inspiration highly affected the final product. Scantlin tried to replicate the vulgar, raunchy demeanor of the raw sound of grunge vocalists that to me felt fell short on tracks like Abrasive. There's a lot of hate from grunge fans about what is and isn't grunge. Let's keep things simple and say that grunge was a musical movement in Seattle, Washington. Anything that was affiliated with that movement can be considered grunge. Hence the post and post-grunge meaning after grunge. Puddle of Mud was in a sense an obvious derivative of Nirvana. Growing up listening to the band planted a seed of similar quality in their music that is clearly seen in this album. Even in tracks like Stressed Out, it felt like Wes simply took a bridge from Green Day's Dookie and instead of using the bass, they used a guitar. Being the first and only album before being signed, Abrasive was a rather vanilla experience. It exhibited the chemistry and the potentiality of the original lineup, but it lacked exploration beyond the simplicity. Abrasive is by far their rarest record, since this was released long before they were signed, thus lacking mass publishing. Abrasive was still a very listenable and at times enjoyable album. My only problem with it is that the band is clearly trying to be something they are not grunge. Regardless of my feelings, however, the album has a mixed reputation on the internet. Reviews on RateYourMusic.com revealed an average of 1.76 out of 89 reviews. In contrast, the YouTube album posted by the official band channel has seen about 13,000 views. Of these, 211 likes and 14 dislikes remain. Comments would reveal that not only people enjoyed the album, but they personally thanked the band for uploading it. These two divided perspectives is seen throughout all of their music career. Abrasive would have been a possible ending for the band. 
By 98, disagreements between the band grew tiresome. Sean Salmon would soon leave as well. As for Kenny Burkett, he would still assist the band as members continually came and went. The band would end up on life support in 99. Wes Scantlin's passion was dwindling. Wes had another major issue on his hand. He had his first child, Jordan, in 97. Wes Scantlin adored his child and saw his child's birth as another reason for him to follow his dreams. Struggling to pay child support, Wes worked as a plumber and in the field of construction. Wes decided to move from Kansas City to New Orleans to manage his girlfriend's career as a dancer. However, prior to this move, he attended a Family Values concert at Kemper Arena in Kansas City which starred Fred Durst. Scantlin was able to sneak backstage with fake backstage passes, as I said this wasn't the first time, and was able to charm a security guard to pass an EP over to Durst. Fred Durst actually admired Puddle of Mud's work and reached out to Scantlin. He was unable to reach him because Scantlin was already in a different state. His voice machine was left unmonitored, until his friend was able to reach out to Scantlin by throwing a party in his honor, hoping to attract his attention. And it worked. A 2003 article done by Pitt told the prodigal son interviewed Wes and his family as well as band members of the original lineup. Fred Durst sent out A&R man Danny Wimmer to Kansas City to audition Puddle of Mud. Due to the only remaining member being Kenny and Wes, they tried to find anyone he could to fill in for the band, and the result was abysmal. Displeased, Wimmer was about to call it quits, but he came with an idea. He decided to take both Scantlin and Burkitt out to Olive Garden. An interview with Burkitt reveals, We agreed to meet at the studio the next day at noon, but they never showed up, Burkitt says. Apparently, they put Wes on a plane to Los Angeles. I spent eight years of my life helping Wes reach his dreams. All he had to do was be man enough to stand up and say, there's one guy that has to come with me. But he couldn't do it. Fred Durst gave Wes a choice. He could either sign with Flawless Records and ditching his band, or he could not be signed at all, leaving him with no opportunity. And Wes saw that one-way ticket and he decided to take it, ditching Kenny Burkett. This decision would affect Wes's reputation in Kansas City. He would be seen as a man who betrayed his old bandmates. At the time, it didn't really matter to Wes. He was signed and given the opportunity to follow his dream. But that didn't mean he was living in a life of riches. He spent months living in a label-provided apartment with only a $100 weekly allowance from his mom. Mind, this is after betraying his longtime bandmate. The backlash of his decision probably left a stigma that could have indirectly affected Wes's lyrics. If you take a look at the track Out of My Head, it has lyrics that state, What is wrong with all my friends? I know I am unlike them. You can tell that Fred Durst played a strong influence on the changes made to the band and Wes himself. We were no longer the puddle of mud that was the wannabe grunge band that relished rock and roll. Their 2001 album, Come Clean, was gearing more focused towards alternative metal, combined with Wes's appugnant personality, hence, Coming Clean. Post-grunge has a tendency to be a hodgepodge of subgenres, so it's hard to find super distinctive characteristics musically. Lyrically, however, post-grunge is a lot more blunt and less third-person than its parent. Typically, post-grunge songs are about hardship, toxic relationships, drug use, and emotional baggage. Think Nickelback, Seether, and Three Days Grace. Disregard any negative feelings you have toward these bands, because while all three of these bands are considered post-grunge, neither of these bands really sound alike. But all of these bands talk about relationship troubles as their main topic of inspiration, and this idea includes Puddle of Mud. Let's take a look at the band's 2001 platinum hit, Come Clean. The album cover reeks grunge with its denim color palette. On the bottom right, we can see a young child urinating in front of a bush. Upon closer inspection, you can see the resemblance of two humans standing afar, looking in the opposite direction of the child. The back shows the same kid walking towards the camera, overjoyed by the day he is having. Inside the lyric book can reveal all the songs handwritten on paper, some pages featuring drawings on them. The background appears to be a shot of desert clay crackling in gray scale. The bottom of the page displays a film reel of the band posing, which burns away at the end of the book. The special thanks page that I possess does not have any mentionings of the old Puddle of Mud band. However, it does say, anyone we forgot, put your name here. Also given is the thanks under Wes's name that gave personal thanks to everyone I missed. Thank you. I love you all. Wesley. 
Come Clean is an accurate depiction of post-grunge. Wes's dark, ruminating self is much more apparent in the lyrics of this album than in Abrasive. She hates me as a diatribe towards his wife at the time, and was one of the co-written tracks with old bandmate Jimmy Allen. Its lyrics stated, She was a queen for about an hour. After that, shit got sour. She took all I ever had. The track Never Changed displays Wes's negation of criticism. Someone's always telling me I'm no good, well I don't care what you say. Someone's always giving me a hard time, well I live day to day. The album would also feature tracks from previous records including Drift and Die from their 94 EP, and Piss It All Away, Nobody Told Me, and the self-title from the album Abrasive. These cover songs is what fueled Scantland to complete the rest of the album, but the influences of Limp Bizkit did lead to the success of Come Clean. The album did great and reached platinum with over 5 million copies sold. ASCAP named Blurry as its song of the year, and the group also won four music awards including one for Blurry reaching number 5 in Billboard Hot 100, things began to turn around for Wes. He achieved his dream and can truly live it to the fullest. Their song Control would be the theme song for Survivor Series 2001. I think it's comical when the lyrics include Scantland telling me he loves the way I smack his ass. While watching wrestling. Jimmy Allen was upset at Scantlin following the initial release of the album Come Clean, for both having his name misspelled and being uncredited for two of his contributions. That was the biggest blow, Allen recalls. It hurt my feelings, but Wes got it changed. He said, I don't want you getting pissed at me and taking my songs away. There's a lot of stress on him, he says, punctuating his phrases with pauses. He's a good guy. But he's got tunnel vision right now. Scantlin was having relationship troubles with his then fiance Michelle Rubin. On March 10th, 2002, the two were arrested for fighting on the side of the highway in Pidu, California. The details of the two's relationship hit headlines everywhere. Apparently, the cops were called because several witnesses reported seeing a man forcing a woman into a Jeep Cherokee driven by a third unknown person. The charges ended up being dropped, but signs of a deteriorating relationship was much more than present in West. Scantlin's music. Five days after the arrest, the band performed Blurry live at MTV Spring Break 2002 in Cancun. which was a successful gig. They would also be featured in MTV Cribs that same year. The band then releases their second album, Life on Display, on November 25th, 2003. The cover is a collage of different band photos designed with an amber color palette. The band name rests on a rectangle cardboard sheet. A look inside the lyric book can reveal another use of film reels along the border of the band portraits. Two of the lyric sheets were written in different directions, thus creating a shape which I found appealing. The lyrics themselves looked hand written then photocopied. The last page would be the special thanks page. The special thanks page send thanks to the whole family including Grandma Scantlin. Paul Phillips had a pretty funny description which humorously stated, I would love to kiss the following asses. The album was featured in another WWE pay-per-view, the 2004 Royal Rumble with the track Nothing Left to Lose. However, this would be the only success for the album as it received mostly negative reviews from critics. Rolling Stone gave it a star. The predominant emotion transmitted by these tired, hawkless tunes is a kind of skull-banging numbness. The album sold 706,000 units, which earns it a gold award, but horrid in comparison to the sales of Come Clean. YouTube comments of the album disagree to the thoughts of critics. Some would call this their favorite Puddle of Mud album. Others would relate to Wes's relationship trauma. Spin You Around is literally the most generic repetitive rock I've ever listened to. Let's take a look at the very first track on, of Life on Display called Away From Me, which reads, Look at me now, just sitting here by myself, and I think you found someone else. Now I'm gonna have to find a way to put the bottle down. The next track, Heal Overhead, read, and I'm sorry for wasting all your time, and I'm sorry for losing on the line, and I think that I'm lost and hard to find, but I feel like I'm living a timeless lie. Throughout the early 2000s, no one really saw where the band was heading. As a matter of fact, their performances in 2002 and 2003 were great. And I mean, Wes was always a drinker in his life. When you drink and party every night, the rock and roll lifestyle begins to take advantage of you.
Following the release of Come Clean, Fred Durst would become less involved in the band. During a 2004 interview with Canada's Chart Magazine, Wes talked about his frustrations with Fred Durst. He doesn't write our songs. He doesn't produce our songs. He doesn't do anything for us. I don't know what he's doing. I don't even know what the guy's like. All I know is, is that he's like Mr. Hollywood guy, Mr. Celebrity, like, I don't hang out with anybody except Hollywood celebrities. Every single fucking interview I've ever fucking done, I get asked about this fucking guy. And for me, to do the interviews all the time and be asked about this certain individual? People think he writes music with me or something. He does not do that. I just don't get it. We have nothing in common. He doesn't even call us. He has his assistant call us to congratulate us on our new record. Yeah, that's how pathetic he is. On April 23rd, 2008, in an interview with Artisan News Service, Wes Scantlin actually took back his previous criticism on Fred Durst. Fred got our foot in the door and helped us out tremendously. I think nowadays he's doing a lot of directing and we don't really speak of him too much, but we appreciate everything he's ever done for our careers. Alright, let's jump to a performance in Toledo, Ohio. On February 22nd, 2004, Puddle of Mud halted their session four songs in. Scantlin then admitted to the audience that he was too fucked up to continue. The rest of the band walked out on Scantlin, and instead of walking out with them, he chose to stick around. So for half an hour, Scantlin was on stage exchanging insults with the crowd. At one point, Scantlin had his guitar above his head, and then he dropped it and it fell to the ground due to the clumsy of alcohol intoxication, took a bottle of water and dunked it over his head and threw it in the crowd. This water bottle was misinterpreted as a glass bottle, which led to his arrest. MTV reported this story. Scantlin eventually headed back to his dressing room, where he was arrested by Toledo police for disorderly conduct intoxication. Charges of criminal mischief and misconduct involving a public transportation system was a reportedly added when Scantlin spit in the Toledo police cruiser en route to his booking, MTV reports. This this incident resulted in Minnesota State University canceling a scheduled Puddle of Mud concert, a defeat that began to degrade the reputation of Puddle of Mud. Wes would tell his side of the story in an MTV article on March 4th. His response to the arrest is, I guess they wanted to make an example out of somebody, so they picked me. But I didn't do anything violent. I wasn't possessing any type of substances. I just got a little too buzzed to play my guitar and sing at the same time, and I apologized to the crowd ten times before I walked off stage. I dumped a bottle of water on my head, and then I just tossed it into the crowd, the singer said. You could hit yourself in the kneecap a hundred times with that bottle, and it wouldn't do anything. Lastly, he responds to the report of him spitting in the cop car. I just can't believe they said I spit on people, man. They're just looking for a story. They want to make the story interesting or demented. So they have to make something up and put it out there. The next thing you know, I'm the scapegoat, and I'm the guy that they blame. Out of playing over 400 shows in the last four years of my life, one of them kind of didn't go very well, and I had a bad day, and I feel really bad for all the fans who had to come to the show to see the bad day happen. Polito, Ohio incident did not fully shatter the band's reputation. Wes's response seemed like he was getting the wake-up call he needed. As a matter of fact, the band still achieved success in cities like Springfield, Illinois. On March 2nd, 2005, Puddle of Mud was given a key to the city by Springfield Mayor Timothy Davlin. The award was certifying the band's accomplishment of selling out tickets within five minutes, a new record in Springfield. In 2005, things for the band grew tense. The poor sale of Life on Display and the recent Toledo incident sparked change for the band. Greg Upchurch would leave the band to replace the drummer of Three Doors Down, who was leaving that band to replace the drummer of Nickelback. Paul Phillips would then quit the band due to creative differences. He would go off to join another post-grunge hard rock band known as Operator. The replacements of the band would first be David Marino and ex-guitarist Jimmy Allen, who both would temporarily fill in these Empty positions. To top the stress of losing his band members that helped him reach him to the top, things were only gonna get worse for Wes. One of his previous decisions were about to come back and haunt him. On June 10th, 2005, ex-bandmates Kenneth Burkett and Sean Salmon filed a civil lawsuit against Flawless Records owned by Universal. The lawsuit was due to the band using songs from previous albums that the two assisted in creating without giving them any compensation. This wasn't significant, however, as all the charges of this were dismissed and settled out of court. Lastly, we can, let's talk about September 24th, 2007. Banned from Graceland for life. During a tour of Elvis Presley's mansion, Wes Scantlin decided to trump into the pool. After being removed from the pool, Wes had this to say, I just wanted to go for a swim.
In 2006, Jimmy Allen left the band a second time. During an interview with Jimmy Allen on HardRockHaven.net, he quotes, I rejoined the band in 2004, and I was let go in 2006, for not signing a shady contract that would have made me a hired gun for the band I started, against all will. Famous was an album that was brewing for three years. Woo! I'm just writing songs and, um, writing songs, and then after I was writing songs, then I wrote some more songs, <laughs> and then when I got sick of writing songs, I wrote some more songs. All right. Yeah. So it must have been hard picking the ones that are going to be on this new album. Sounds like you had a lot to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. I have to basically kind of like, there's about 50 or 60 songs that were written. and The band was exploring a common practice found in the hip hop industry of using multiple producers to match the feel of each individual song. To give you an idea of what this meant, here is the producers for the previous record. Now here is the number of producers for Famous. Among these, you see punk rock legend Bill Stevenson. He was the drummer for Black Flag and Descendants. Earlier in this project, I mentioned how Wes's issues were clearly shown in his music musical lyrics. Wes would actually explain his feelings on this matter. Have you ever heard of those lyrics by Nine Inch Nails, I just made you up to hurt myself? <laughs> That's kind of how it is for songwriters, I think, you know? You almost create drama in your life just to get some good inspiration. Anything that irks you a little bit for some weird unbeknownst reason is good for really passionate songs. I write a lot of stuff, but it's like a team. Everybody's got their inspiration that they put into it. Famous was a originally supposed to be titled Living on Borrowed Time. Christian Stone went home to Massachusetts to visit his family for Christmas, and someone showed him a picture of his brother in Iraq. Living on Borrowed Time tattooed on him, Douglas explains. So unbeknownst to either brother, one had written a song with Wes called Living on Borrowed Time, and then the other had a tattoo of Living on Borrowed Time on his chest. So it was kind of a freaky coincidence. Despite this, Flawless Records renamed the album at the last minute to match its single. This was kind of disappointing, since the meaning from the previous idea seemed so much more sentimental. So how was Famous? Out of every Puddle of Mud record, this one I despise the most. My copy of Famous was bought at a Salvation Army for $1. Since then, it has suffered from severe water damage from sitting in my car all day. An already bad sign that I did not care for this album. The first two tracks being Famous and Living on Borrowed Time, which to me were okay. Famous, I got a soft spot for, cause, you know. How is it that you had so many different backgrounds in music working on this record, yet have 90% of the album be the same thing that I've already heard before? Psycho was one of the more popular tracks on this record and actually earned the album some rewards. Psycho will kind of catch you by surprise when three hours later you are humming the lyrics in your head on your way home. It Was Faith displayed Wes's faith of Christianity. I'm not a follower of Christianity, however, throughout my life I've been exposed to a lot of bands that I really enjoyed and then later discovered that they were labeled as Christian rock. And then I really thought to myself, does it really matter? I don't really think it does. You don't need to be a believer of their faith to be able to relate to their music, but Mud's track It Was Faith is not like that. It was way too direct. It's not What about the track that Bill Stevenson worked on, Radiate? A lot of people really enjoyed the track. The track kind of used a very similar guitar tuning found in Blurry and sounded very well produced, but really it stood to me exactly the same as every other track on the record. The verses were always repetitive, choruses were using catchy hooks to keep the track palatable to the rock radio audience. Once again, reviews for this album stood divided. In the field of rock music, Puddle of Mud succeeded with hitting number 11 on Billboard with Psycho, but in music as a whole, they were losing listeners. By this point, fans would call out Puddle of Mud on their use of filler tracks. Scantlin would be unhappy with the results of the additional producers brought in, stating in a 2009 interview that the initial version was fine, but he expressed his regrets about the final release. There's a lot of weird stuff that happened during that record. Oh, oh. Like what? Uh, just, you know, there's a lot of co-writes and stuff. Some people were brought in that probably shouldn't have been brought in, but 
they were brought in, you know, and it's kind of a weird situation for me. So it's this new record with all just you guys, no co-writes? The album sold 31,000 copies in the first week, and an overall sum of 363,000 copies total, nearly half of their second. Wes would use piracy as an explanation in the decrease of sales. How has, you know, the evolution of the digital age, how has that, you know, changed your career and, and the way you do music? Uh, it doesn't change the way we do music, it's, you know, really just changes the sales of the record. I mean, that's all it is, man. You know, back in the day, you know, people were, like, dubbing, like, cassette tapes. But now it's, like, you know, it's a lot easier to do it. It's way quicker. You know, like, if you're, like, a real true fan of Puddle of Mud, you would go out there, buy the record, at least one of them, be a cool fan, and uh, don't steal it. I and mean, then stealing's kind of a pathetic, you know, anybody that steals anything is kind of a joke. I don't, I don't steal anything from anybody. I've never been on the Internet. I've never stole a record in my life. So, I don't know. I guess if people want to be chumps and steal records, go ahead. But if you want to be, like, a real cool person, you know, go out and buy it. Because we spend a lot of time working on it in the studio, you know. We're not just... The, the songs just don't arrive from God. I mean, well, they kind of sort of kind of do arrive from God, but... In a 2008 interview with TK101, Mark the Shark actually took out a printed copy of the band's Wikipedia page and presented it to Wes. Have you seen your Wikipedia entry? Oh god, I don't even know. <laughs> what does it say now? Well, they list the, um, the first lineup of the band formed in 1993, and yeah. uh, you'll see here Sean uh, Nikaza, the drummer, Lucas Molzan plays the skin flute. <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yeah, and uh, we've got Ben Stillwell on bass and Dan Volpe on cowbell. Uh, wow. I think the only uh, piece of the band missing might be a rusty trombone. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 or a donkey punch or something. <laughs> so you guys uh, might want to go in there and update your Wikipedia. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Trouble. That could be a, uh, I think somebody's mess, trying to mess with my head here. <laughs> it's okay. Cool names, though. Actually, th was this song supposed to be the title track from the famous album? Because we had, we had heard that the album was originally supposed to be called Living on, on Borrowed Time, and then it was changed to Famous. Yeah, I don't know who changed it. They, the, the people that call themselves They, I've um, secret, like, ninja style, been trying to find out who they are, and right. I do know who you are now. <laughs> they, the They. So, <laughs> you got some stuff coming. All right, this is Wes with uh, his band Puddle of Buck, Living on Borrowed Time, music from the famous album Live from Bay Fest. That's New Rock First, TK101. Wes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, man. All right. In 2009, Paul Phillips would rejoin the band and replace Christian Stone. A 2009 interview at WZZO revealed that the two naturally started hanging out again after previously going through a toxic period with the band. And then we just started hanging out, like, naturally and, like, talking on the phone and, like, uh, he came to Jacksonville and we hung out where I'm from, Jacksonville. We went out to bars and, and then it, one thing led to another and he called me up and he was like, hey, we got a show next week. He's like, I want you to come out. So I came to L.A. and we decided, I stayed at his house and we just wrote songs every night and, you know, split a bottle. And I mean, there's not, I mean, you know, I'm not getting any younger, dude. I hear I you. I can definitely tell you that for sure. I hear you. I hear you. And Paul's face is getting a lot uglier each <laughs> second by the minute. Actually, I'm like a lot <laughs> uglier than I when Your I walk face, in the dude, my fists are going to be real, like, they're going to be they're best friends. Date. They're going to yeah. later. You got to stop at freaking the coffee store and get yeah. whatever, man. Like, we would have been here earlier, but he had to, you know, he had to. Yeah, yeah brother, the brother Joel, a limo driver, calls and goes, these guys need their Starbucks. We yeah, but I don't <laughs> drink coffee, I don't drink caffeine, so he's a psychotic, addicted, weird person. You want to you say I'm ugly, I'm psychotic? You I know, are. I feel, I feel love with you. Right? There's a lot of love, you can tell. There's about 50 or 60 songs that were written, and... Wes Scantlin would come across as a man with no filter. He would be vulgar, immature, and he's a bit of a pervert. But to others, he was mellow, laid back, and rather friendly. So naturally, people developed a very strong love-hate relationship with Wes. 2008, we would find success for singles like She Hates Me, which won three Rock Song of the Year awards. But that success was only limited to rock. But outside of rock, Wes Scantlin's reputation was dwindling. 2010, we'll find the band to release their last studio album for the next nine years. The next album by the band was going to be called Jacket on the Rack, which was a song named after a pullout joke. I'm not joking. Uh, yeah, it's called Jacket on the Rack. Jacket on the Rack? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and where did that come from? Me and my guitar player were, uh, we were getting hammered at the bar, and, uh, some chick was talking about, like, not getting pregnant, and her boyfriend got her pregnant. And then my guitar player was like, 
Doesn't you know how to like pull out and jack it on the rack? Yeah, obviously that didn't happen. I don't understand that, man. No? Did you like Jack on the Rack better? or how I think, work? yeah, I do. Personally, this is Wes Galen. I, I personally <laughs> like Jack it on the Rack or Spooge Fest way better than Volume 4. All right, so what happened? Why did it become Volume 4? So I'd like, go to the gym every day, so I would. He knows some, like, he probably knows somebody at, like, Walmart. He's like, I think you know, what like, you got some CEO of Walmart or something. He's like one of your best friends. Yeah, He's awesome. like, I ain't going to work Jack it on the Rack, Spooge Fest thing ain't going to work. Dude. Uh, it's actually, oh, it's actually Sam true. himself. He's on my speed dump. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> Wes would still mention naming the next record so during a 2015 interview, which was five years after. I'm thinking about calling it Jack on the Rack, you know. Um, <laughs> Why is that? Because I was uh, intimate with this one girl, like, back a few years, and, uh, you know, she, like, kind of turned around and said, Jack it on the Rack. And I was like, what? And she's like, just Jack it on the Rack. But we'll talk a little bit more about that source in a bit. Volume 4, Songs in the Key of Love and Hate, would be the album's official name releasing on December 8th. The album would be produced by John Kurzweig, who was the producer of Come Clean and Life on Display. Their first time together in six years, Scantlin commented on production work. Even though we hate messing with success, we felt adding newcomer Brain Virtue to the producer mix would be a welcome change. What we got is 10 tracks of exactly what we were looking for. We've not only navigated the minefield successfully, but we've laid out our own on the battlefield that is this business. As self-sufficient as ever, we virtually depend on the fans to come through for us, and because of that, this band is built for the future. 2009 would give us the music video Spaceship. The music video had those bandmates aboard a spaceship as they sang across the depths of space, making Star Wars references and whatnot. The band receives an alert on the ship of a female with antennas and the label Alien Lightform blinks alerting them. The band then traveled to Planet X to pick up a stray hot female, and she starts dancing in the back of the ship. They continued to travel the galaxy, picking up babe after babe, while they partied in space. Lyric-wise, I wouldn't necessarily agree with his perspective on females, but all in all, the music video received mostly favorable views, as it stands with 4.3 million hits on YouTube. Not really the greatest, but pretty fair in the field of rock. This track would be featured as track 2 on volume 4. The cover of the album shows the eye of a woman with heavy black makeup. The makeup itself reveals sign of wear from the possible friction of human tears. The disc would be a zoomed in shot of an iris, and removing said disc would reveal a closed eye of the same girl. The lyric book features images of the band surrounded by a dark vignette. The lyrics are written in red font and are pretty hard to read at times. Another shot of the band looking down is of what kind of looks like a well. The last page is of a woman in heavy black makeup in the state of distress. Actually, the same photo that was in low opacity that we saw earlier. I mean, it seems post-grunge to me, but the design of the album is kind of bland and very repetitive. Mine, this is 2009. Post-grunge was at its peak, but this peak was slowly lowering. The band was gonna need to do a lot better than this to compete against these albums. Look at Three Days Grace's 2009 record, Life Starts Now. And while the album isn't the band's best, the record itself had art applied to it to make the album look one of a kind. The image displays two people with bats brutalizing this pile of TVs that where in the presence of blood morphs into birds that are flying away from the assault. This helps guide the viewer's eyes upward into the band logo. It was creative, had a wise use of color, and it was edgy, but a beneficial edgy. Or how about Breaking Benjamin's record, Dear Agony? Also 2009, it displays a CAT scan of frontman Benjamin Burnley. I actually have a tattoo of this record. My point being, having a zoomed in image of an eye with dark makeup can only go so far until it's seen as negative for its minimalistic effort. The album started with their second single, Stoned, which ends with Wes vomiting and saying fuck several times. Fuck. The mixing is definitely a lot more refined than previous albums. Wes's voice is no longer significantly louder than the rest of the instruments, and I can say this finally does sound like Puddle of Mud. I mean, granted it does not sound like 94 Puddle of Mud, but the guitar finally gets a bit more love in tracks like Out of My Way. But this album also had a lot of filler tracks like Keep It Together, which I found were too cookie cut. 
However, Wes Scantlin has been known as a bad Kurt Cobain knockoff, and many Puddle of Mud tracks that try to be grunge typically fail doing so. The biggest example being Hooky. Wes wanted to take Kurt's use of symbolism and simplicity found in their single School by making a song about his kid playing hooky. Hey, I don't wanna go to school. The simple bass and guitar rift attempts to attract viewers with its grunge influences, however, the lyrics are too trivial and more critically mentioned, just too simple. Metaphorically, it's like the band played all of its cards in its deck, but never updated that deck with new cards. It felt that the band spent four albums looking for the sound that they wanted, and when they did achieve it, it was overdone. The record only sold 100,000 units, less than famous. Bassist Doug Arditto would officially leave the band after nine years, and he would be replaced by Damon Starsky from the band Burn Season, a really decent new metal band. This would only be for a year before he came back. The band was offered to create a song for the 2010 Winter Olympics. According to the band, they were given a deadline of three days and were unable to get the track done on time. That's awesome. Is he going to use the song in the Olympics? Is that what the... <laughs> that's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the... They approached us to do it and we wrote this song and just didn't sleep. I mean, they was like... Oh, it was like, okay, ready to go. We need it in like three days. Mix, master, completely done. We're like... What? Okay, so we did it and then, you know, that whole little... However, the song was completed and titled Shook Up the World. It was released on February 10th, 2010 as a website exclusive. All proceeds went to support Team USA. June 10th, 2011, Wes and Doug were interviewed during the Download Festival in Donington, England, several times. Wes can be rather easily distracted in these interviews while Doug does all the talking. This is the good that people see in Wes, the inner goofiness that can almost charm you in a little sense. Wes was at the the Kerrang Awards earlier this year, and there was rumors that he heckled Jared Leto. There's no evidence that these rumors are true, but Wes denied the allegations and felt offended by the rumors. That's all right, though. You, right. you were at the uh, you were at the Kerrang Awards last night. Yeah. And uh, you you met you met uh, our good friend Jared Leto. Oh, I love him. He's you know he, he's, he's, he's awesome. He, he's an, he's an amazing character, a great actor, and a, and a very successful musician. But you heckled him. You heckled him. You, you told him to fuck no, off. No, not me. It wasn't you? No. <laughs> We've been misinformed. Let's just, let's just yeah. imagine you did. Uh, it why, was all. A, why would you do it, that? It was all. A, it was all a good fun. He he was doing the he was doing the funny thing about the rehab. <laughs> You know, we're all rock It's musicians. not my fault he was banging, like, heroin, man, you know, for his whole life. Yes. <laughs> so tell us about the heroin. I don't know. I never did it. He obviously did. Apparently he's very Moorish. We're actually, uh... uh I heckled Jared? You, really? Did uh, I really? That, that, that's the word on the street. Oh, uh, really? That's, uh... You're well, getting, we're in the grass. You're, so. you're, you're getting gossiped about. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm glad. Hello, everybody. We're here with Brian Starfucker, and he's got big balls. That's right. right. He well, knows. Talk now and tell me to shut the fuck up. <laughs> Please tell me to shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Okay, okay. You know, when did you have that moment where you realized puddle of mud has made it? Uh, I was in my uh, I was in my car getting a <laughs> and uh, control came on. It was pretty awesome. I think I had a big doobie in my mouth too. It was rad. <laughs> <laughs> you think drinking's important? Uh, drinking? I think drinking water is very important. Yes. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and licking. No, I actually encourage that because in my experience, the bands that do the best are the ones that get the most shit talked on them. The band released a cover album titled Rediscovered on August 30th, 2011. Paul and Wes both were interviewed by a Las Vegas radio called KOMP. In the 2011 interview, Wes talks about the hate messages he receives on his phone. Oh, like one day, I mean, I get like, I get like hate text messages from people, you know? And it's just so weird, you know? It's like, you know, my mom just used to leave like a little note, you know, by the answering machine, but... I was debating about including this album since it's not really a studio album, and I've already talked so much about the previous records, but I will say this. The record itself looks and feels super nice. I mean, the, the disc looks like a very well-printed vinyl record, and the lyric book would fold out into four sheets that could kind of reveal a mini poster of the band. The poster shows a film reel, which is actually kind of the third time this has been done. While I won't say the album is horrid, because, you know, it's a cover album. You pay for what you get. This album would be a marker that labels the upcoming turmoil for the band. Their last three studio albums showed very little growth, just an increase in quality. 
And I feel the need to be critical here because Wes Scantlin is about to enter his most shameful period in his entire life. Within 10 years, we saw the band create a platinum record and maintain their relevance in the music industry. But the next six years, however, we're gonna see all that come crashing down on Wes. On November 29th, 2011, Scantlin would finalize his divorce papers. Wes and Jessica both agreed that Scantlin would pay $2,500 a month in alimony. Scantlin apparently had a prenuptial agreement before the marriage. He signed his signature with two smiley faces on May 21st, 2012, but this wouldn't be the only financial loss for Scantlin. On December 11th, 2011, the IRS tracked down Wes for not paying around 60 grand in taxes in 2009. TMZ would begin to cover the Wes Scantlin story. TMZ would almost be a plague placed upon Scantlin that will amplify his downfall in the next three years to come. I dislike TMZ. There's a reason for that. They have absolutely no boundaries and will do and will go great lengths to create a juicy story for their own personal gain. TMZ was able to find documents with the LA County Recorder Office to discover the exact amount of taxes owed to a T. $44,726.23. And thus, the chain of arrests would begin. Some of these cases headlined on national news. Every mess up that Wes commits would be caught, recorded, and published within hours. Well, we're lucky as fans, and thanks for being willing to share these stories with me, and it's cool to, to be able to touch on this stuff with you. You really, like I said, you've made songs that can really mean a lot to someone like Blurry. You made songs that people can really rock out to and have a lot of fun with, and that's cool. You can cover the bases like that. You know, you're a diverse artist. That's why I wanted to touch base with you and, and just let you know we appreciate it. On January 12th, Scantlin was pulled over in Culver City, California at 3 a.m. of a minor traffic violation. It was found that he was intoxicated and in possession of what officers called strange powder and pills, and he also did not have a license. This was later confirmed to be cocaine. The pills were discarded from the case. He was booked then released on bail for $10,000. The case was updated in April. Wes pleaded guilty, resulting in the two misdemeanors to be dropped. Scantlin, in exchange, would have to provide evidence of being part of a drug counseling program. The judge agreed that his record would be cleared in 18 months, so as long as he obeys the law, till then. He entered rehab, which was good, but continued to drink alcohol, a clear source to some of his problems. On September 4th, Scantlin would be arrested after allegedly getting into an argument with a flight crew member over refusing to sell him alcohol. Plane made an emergency landing for his arrest. He he would be booked for public intoxication. TMZ had someone at the scene taking discreet blurry photos of Wes while a huge TMZ watermark protects the brand. The headline, Cuffed and Busted, exists. Scantlin took the stance that he was completely sober during the whole fiasco. Another clip was filmed by someone on the airplane that was posted on YouTube. The description stated, Dude was arrested on a flight I was on today. He was sitting in front of me at first, and he did look a bit buzzed, but the dude was pretty cool. They forced him to sit in the back of the plane and he was pretty mellow after that. He seemed to be having a pretty good time. If a grown man cannot purchase a beer on a five-hour flight from Boston to LA, then I think the airlines are completely, COMPLETELY losing their minds. I was arrested for being sober on an airplane. Wes then showed us two big bruises on his chest, claiming the arresting officers were responsible for the injuries. This is what they did to me. On February 24th, 2013, Jessica Scantlin would accuse ex-husband Wes of stealing her Honda Pilot overnight. She woke up with her car missing and then contacted Wes's manager. After requesting her car to be returned, she was given a location to retrieve it. Wes's manager denied it was Wes, but many believe he was responsible. One piece of evidence being that the car was not broken into. No windows were smashed or hot wiring technique was used, meaning that someone might have used a spare key. It was allegedly returned with bumper damage and a missing side view nearer. This is the same car Wes gave Jessica following their divorce, adding plausible cause against Wes. The car would be checked for fingerprints, but no news on this case was found found, and no photos of the car were found online. On May 7th, 2013, Scantlin was arrested again in Hollywood, California around 11.30 p.m. after two warrants were out for his arrest, one for driving with, uh, with a suspended license and another involving his cocaine offense earlier that year. He was released on, on $11,000 bail. On May 13th, 2013, Scantlin was arrested for domestic violence after several witnesses saw Scantlin shook his ex-wife and then tried to drag her by the arm. 
Farm. Puddle of Mud would also face another challenge of their reputation, poor attendance. Puddle of Mud would tour Western New York in June of 2013, but their Rochester show was cancelled due to Wes missing his flight. They also cancelled their Labatt Canal concert in Lockport, New York later that week due to an unknown illness. And now for the vandalism case. On July 24th, 2013, Wes would be arrested for vandalism. Let me summarize what happened. Alright, so Wes's neighbor was Sasha Gradiva, I apologize. He went nuts. I mean, he just got on my patio and started to crush the wall between our properties. And, um, and this is pretty much it, a few times. Really? What, 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 what do you think triggered this? Why, uh... I have no idea. The guy just think, I don't know, maybe he likes my view. According to Wes, a part of her property was built on Wes's side of the yard. Frustrated, Wes and another took a sledgehammer and started to attack the wall dividing Wes's and Sasha's home. Wes was also accused of using a buzzsaw to attack the home of Sasha. TMZ literally waited out at the police station just so they could record Wes's reaction and asked him questions immediately after being booked, in which he told the sentimental journalist, My neighbor vandalized my house, so I had to take action. When asked about the buzz saw, Wes denied it. Why not a baseball bat? Call a sledgehammer, dog. <laughs> so, so it was your neighbor's fault. January 4th, 2014, Scantlin would be sued by American Express for not paying his credit card debt. By this point, something was rather clear to me. Wes himself was not only in denial of his actions, throughout the entire band's career, Scantlin would play the victim card. He blamed things not in his control for his mistakes, and basically acted like people were just simply beating him up just because he was a celebrity. Like how he was a victim of piracy, or how he was a victim of having bad producers or how he was a victim of being abused by the law. People were starting to get frustrated in Wes because of this. As the number of bad incidents grew, it was becoming harder and harder to side with Wes. And as much as I hate TMZ for using journalism as an excuse for stalking others, I can't blame them for covering this story. A lot of people genuinely wanted to know what Wes was going to do next. Wes was becoming a complete train wreck. And this negative criticism would only make things worse, as Wes's performances were about to become much more destructive. No, because flight attendants have some kind of power trip right now. The poor reputation of Puddle of Mud was about to get worse as allegations of lip syncing emerged during a performance in Dallas on April 16th, 2014. The show at first seemed to be going very well as the crowd cheered and supported the band, but during the performance it began to appear that the track playing in the background seemed off, almost as if you plugged in a CD and began to play the very first track. However, this only seemed limited to Wes, as the guitar and drums seemed rather natural. As for the vocals, it was clear. Wes was lip syncing. <laughs> As the performance continued, it seemed Wes was getting more intoxicated by the song. During the performance of Spaceship, Wes would pick up the mic stand and slam it to the ground. He then walked off stage and stayed off stage for several minutes until coming back out. The crowd began to boo him. Sing your song! Shut, shut up! Since we suck so bad, you really put your middle finger in a fucking air. He would also get belligerent and would start calling people out. The performance of Already Gone was one of the most memorable points of the show. It sounded like Wes's voice was rather shot, but now all of a sudden it was almost like the backtrack never even existed. The singing was just not there. He then flings his mic stand and you can no longer hear his voice at all. All you can see is him continually flicking off proud and pointing for a couple of minutes while the band repeatedly continues the final verse of the song, Already Gone, which ironically Wes states the lyrics, I gotta kill the addiction, which after Wes then throws his faulty mic into the crowd. Paramedics were apparently called to the scene to help an injured audience member, but it's not confirmed if the mic toss caused it. Wes then chucked a few bottles of water into the crowd in which 
which people splashed back at him. As the rest of the band slowed themselves down, Wes abruptly threw off his shirt onto the ground and then stated, October 2014, Wes finally responded with an interview by Chicago Tribune. Wes stated, It looks bad, you know, Scantlin says. It brings me down so hardcore that I don't really acknowledge it. I know it exists, but I'd rather live my life happy. If they were saying it about you, do you do the exact same thing after all these years? I've been brought down and kicked in the butt so many times by so many haters. I'm just kind of used to it. I've been called a woman beater that I hit a woman. You know, the internet has ruined part of my family as well. It's crazy to be me. You should step in my shoes. My son, my mom, my dad, they read things on the internet. It's ruined my relationship with my actual family. Scantlin, who says he will happily talk to an interviewer about any subject they want, does not like to talk about Dallas. It wasn't that big of a deal to me. It was blown out of proportion. Nobody got hurt. It was a cup of water. I don't care about Dallas. Who gives a crap? That was like, what, six months ago? Unless you want to dwell on it, sweetie. Wes Scantlin's perspective about the incident was that everything was totally blown out of proportion. I mean, it's very clear that he is in denial, believing that TMZ is the reason that he has ruined relationships in his life, when he could consider the fact that maybe he would get too intoxicated and become a danger of society with his frivolous actions. And as much as I do not approve of many of Wes Scantlin's mistakes in life, Wes does have a point. The news media did seem like they were at war with Scantlin. Ever since we showed you this video after the Oscars, you've been asking us why it's such a petty crime. So it's your neighbor's fault. Using extreme words to exaggerate the actions of Wes in order to make the story sound much more scandalous. But Wes's claims are not strong enough to face all the different sources, including live video footage. His show at Dallas wouldn't have been blown out of proportion if Wes would have been more responsible with his drinking habits. And the ignorance of these drinking habits is going to make life even worse for Scantlin. On January 16th, 2015, Wes Scantlin was arrested at Denver National Airport for taking a ride on the baggage carousel. The news media decided the best way to cover the story is to question why Scantlin wasn't federally charged. He was booked for trespassing at the state level and was bailed out by a fan. On April 2nd, 2015, in Scottsdale, Arizona, Puddle of Mud got four songs in until Wes ended up smashing his own guitar as well as a microphone and a piece of a drum kit. He then walked out and took a cab, thus ditching the show altogether. On April 15th, he was arrested at Mitchell International Airport in Milwaukee for disorderly conduct charges. Wes was about to board a flight when the attendant noticed that Scantlin was intoxicated. She asked him to sit down while the other passengers boarded. Wes then called someone up on his cell phone and said, that bitch is not gonna let me on. Deputies reported that Wesley was talking very loudly on his cell phone, claiming that he was going to sue the airlines. He then, he then told the officer, I don't have to talk to you, and then tried to walk out but was quickly arrested. On June 19th, 2015, Puddle of Mud canceled another show due to Wes not making his flight. Puddle of Mud performances were getting worse and inconsistent. It was either that Wes Scantlin wouldn't make his flight, or if he did make his flight, he would be too drunk to be able to perform properly. So naturally, you can understand why a lot of people were frustrated in Wes during these performances. But the people that were frustrated in his tantrums were about to take a stand. Next up, we're going to talk about how the band deleted their Facebook page. Here's another lip-syncing incident that happened on June 20th, 2015 in Versailles, Ohio, a day after missing the previous show. During the entire performance, Wes was so intoxicated he couldn't even remember the lyrics of his songs. He wasn't playing any guitar and the backtrack was louder than it was in Dallas. The displeased crowd allegedly booed the band off stage. However, following the show, fans were so pissed, they blew up the band's Facebook page. What a joke last night's concert was, said one person. When you get booed off stage, you need to reevaluate your life. It's sad when the opening band was better than the main act, said another. The backlash from this performance was really bad. So bad that Puddle of Mud deleted their Facebook page. Yes, the same incident in which another band took it over to promote their project. 
Puddle of Mud's Facebook URL was immediately taken over by an obscure Texan band called Black Heart Saints, who gleefully changed the page's name to check out this band instead, and even reached out to Puddle of Mud's label, booking agents, and management, offering their services as a possible replacement act that would be guaranteed to give 110%. The Black Heart Saints' attempts failed, and Puddle of Mud would soon regain control of the page. Throughout this whole project, I was on the fence about Wes's erratic behavior. I've talked about the bad, and while many would object, I've talked about the good. But now, here's the ugly. There was one interview done with Wes that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. On July 11th, 2015, Dolly McCarthy would do a surprise interview with the band. Did you know I was coming? It's time to wake up. You ready to go on stage? But first, you gotta talk! All right, let's do this. While the rest of the band was eating pulled pork, Dolly went into Wes's living quarters to talk with the man. Wes would hardcore simp over Dolly throughout the entire interview. Should we get the rest of the guys in the bed with us? No, it's all right. They're cool. <laughs> you guys are just got to wait. Wes and I are having a moment I'm not here. into like, like foursomes, you know? My frustration lies with the fact that Wes is being filmed and he does not show any respect for himself to not give this girl the fuck me eyes during the entire interview. So, um, so tonight's concert, what, are, what can fans, oh, ex nice, what can fans expect? <laughs> you got a ring on your finger? Yeah, do you like it? It's the Pisces ring. Oh good, you're good. Okay, you're, you're solo. Alright, cool. Alright, hey, I'm kidding. I'm right. down with it. I'm so, cool with this. Um, maybe your girlfriend's not. <laughs> Uh, she don't care. She likes that kind of stuff. Is she here today? No, nah, no. Nah, she's in Los Angeles. When Dolly mentions that the band sold around 8 million records, Wes boldly says, Maybe 35 million, you know? Well, you Plus have... all the downloads and them. Yeah. We are 25 years together, yeah. you know? I don't know. The man with the internet, you know? Yeah, uh, I've like, mathematically figured it out in my head where we're probably pushing almost a half a billion, you know? <laughs> Sleep, eat, sex, sleep, eat, sex, sleep, eat, sex. I'm sure the fans will really like to hear that. Watch a movie. Brutally watch honest. A movie, watch a movie. In bed with Wes. Yeah. How about it? An artist who claims he writes every single day looks like he doesn't do anything for himself besides lie around. There is no self-exploration in that whatsoever. And Wes is a grown man. He's past his 20s by this point. How can an artist grow and create new content with this lifestyle? You don't. What I've learned is that the Puddle of Mud's albums showed very little growth as we progressed. Sure, we got some catchy singles that stay in your head, but every album Wes and Doug would promote, they would make it seem like they spent countless nights writing and recording, claiming that before every album they have up to 60 to 80 songs made and only 10 actually make it to the album? I just can't believe it. On July 26, 2015, Wes was speeding at 3.45 a.m. in Olivia, Minnesota following a show. Police began to signal Wes to pull over, however he decided to continue to speed. The chase reached a little over 100 miles per hour. His blood alcohol level was 0 .30, four times the legal limit. He faced a felony charge of fleeing a police officer in a motor vehicle and two gross misdemeanors of driving under the influence. These charges were soon dropped. On August 5, 2015, Wes Scantlin was arrested for DUI again. This time, it was for pot possession and driving while stoned in South Dakota. His last 2015 arrest would be on December 26th for drug possession in Beverly Hills. His bail was at $51,000. Neither, neither am I. No. Yeah, I just need like one girl. Oh, God. 2015 would be a detriment year for Scantlin. On top of it all, Scantlin would have his house foreclosed, a defeat that displayed his financial loss in life. 2016 Scantlin was not going to let this go. Now we're going to talk about the incident in which Wes accuses another man of stealing his home. On January 10th, 2016, Scantlin tried to re-enter his foreclosed home. He broke into it using a hatchet to the window. He allegedly smashed property inside the home. He and two others were booked for trespassing at 20 grand bail. He would be arrested again for skipping a court hearing involving this incident. This increased his bail to $250,000. The foreclosure of his property hit Scantlin hard. His frustration would turn to delusion during his show in Marietta, Ohio. In the middle of the show, Wes halted performance and stared at, at a random member in the crowd. Who are you, man? He began to accuse the concert goer for stealing his home. Footage revealed the crowd to chant, Fuck that bitch, but Wes continued to stare and asked, 
Are you the dude, man? Are you the dude that looked at me the other day in the fucking eyeball and said, fuck you? The guitarist began to play along comically, but Wes told him to stop. Nah, man, hold on, stop. Alright, look. I'm gonna cut this set short. Did you really fucking seriously say that to me in my fucking eyeballs, man, in my own fucking home? He then continued to question the man standing in front of him. You stole my fucking house? This motherfucker right here? You stole my fucking house? And now you gotta stand right in fucking front of me? You stole- this motherfucker stole my fucking house. You motherfucker, man. You are a fucking insane freak of nature. Wes continued to stare down the dude. Infuriated by the dude's laughter, he then ends the set saying, Fuck this shit. I'll eat the goddamn money. Fuck it. This motherfucker right here stole my motherfucking house. And now he's standing right fucking in front of me, laughing at me, and he's fucking thinking I'm fucking a joke. He then tells the camera mouth. guy to film the dude, and then throws the mic on the ground and continues to point at the dude as the venue slowly plays Three Days Grace in the background, indicating the end of the show. Let's talk about the Gin Mill concert incident, which happened on February 18th, 2016. During the performance, Wes began to have a verbal war with the audience. Wes would direct his anger towards the sound guy. I don't give a fuck who's fucking around with you, man. He's playing greasy. But if you don't get this sound shit straight from my punk ass, this show's gonna suck, man. I don't give a fuck who gave you fucking anything, man. It's not worth it. These people are worth it. He would accuse him as trying to sabotage the performance because he hates Puddle of Mud. For almost 10 minutes, Wes was talking shit to the sound guy. So the mic was finally of Wes's liking as he said, But you can pull it back together, man. You can pull it back together, man. You can pull it back together, motherfucker. You can pull it back together. Maybe you know right again. Oh shit. This motherfucker pull it back together. Everybody give this motherfucker a oh, shit. In a separate clip from the venue, you can hear Wes dead ass gaslight the sound guy, making a song directed towards him saying that he is fucking fired. He then would say, We don't want this show to be about anger, okay? Literally seconds after dropping the N word. But you're the most brilliant sound guy in the whole world, Mr. Cool Pants. You're about to waste everybody's time, Mr. Sound Genius of the World. Whatever your fucking name is, I don't even want to fucking know. My grandmother would not even want to fucking make anything. This song is not for you, y'all. This is the last song that we're gonna play because the sound man hates Puddle of Mud. The band begins to play the song Blurry, however Wes took his time and continued to shout you suck. Look what you did, dog. The show ended with the members being booed off stage. The venue actually responded to this with a Facebook post stating, For the record, the sound man last night has 28 years of experience. The opening band sounded great by all accounts. It's pretty ridiculous to say that he purposely tried to sabotage Puddle of Mud because he hates them, as the singer suggested. Totally bizarre. If any adjustments were needed, as you sometimes see at shows, maybe asking the sound team to make them instead of immediately launching into a stream of praise 
Jay's accusations and insults might have been a little bit more productive. On March 20th, 2016, Wes was in Italy performing Blurry. Wes does not seem as active during this performance. As the song continued, Wes became sluggish and started to sporadically halt singing. He began to rock himself back and forth as he backs away and shakes his head. He enters the next verse sitting. He appears to struggle to hold himself up until he slowly repositions himself to the floor. Then he stops singing altogether. <laughs> Wes had fainted on stage. Two days later, on March 22nd, the band was performing at Doncaster's Diamond Live Lounge in the UK. Wes was reportedly drunk at the incident. He had no guitar in his hand and he simply sat on a stool. Wes was reportedly too drunk to perform at the incident. <laughs> He would then go on a rant about David Morano, the dude who stole his house. My name is David Moreno and I thought- The crowd wasn't having any of it, as one man would repeatedly tell Wes- Yo, check one, two. Wes! Fuck Trump! Fuck Trump! Right, Wes would continue to sit on stage with the mic trying to speak into it. Puddle of Mud's response to this incident was on Twitter, and it was in response to the rumor that the band might quit. My band did not quit. We played seven shows together in the UK. The media makes up stories. End of subject. Hashtag Puddle of Mud. On April 4th, 2016, Wes would have a standoff with police outside his home. Law enforcement reported that they got a call about a burglary in a car sitting in Scantlin's driveway. When they arrived, Wes ran into his home and refused to leave. The situation was escalated to the point where there were 30 police officers surrounding his home, some armed with assault rifles. After a couple of hours, the police broke down his door and arrested Wes and another. Wes claimed that he was trying to jumpstart his friend's car. However, as escalated as the situation was, it was not really all that significant. He wasn't charged from the standoff, and he was really only arrested due to a previous warrant. On August 16th, 2016, Wes was caught drinking on a flight. The article was accompanied with photos of Wes drinking small liquor shots. He was removed from the flight, thus canceling a show in Louisville. However, the same source provides images of Wes with the flight crew and a smile on his face. Alright, the bomb squad incident. August 23rd, 2016. When Wes's car got broken into, Scantlin would come up with a plan to deter criminals by hooking up a homemade car alarm made out of a radio with wires attached to two vehicles. The neighbors became concerned and reported it to the police. The bomb squad would be called to dispose of the device and it resulted in four surrounding buildings to be evacuated. Wes was not arrested for this incident. During a performance on March 24th, 2017, the mic stand came apart on Wes. Wes stopped the performance and sat on a stool and began to complain. I'm sitting down at a concert because of a microphone stand. <laughs> the crowd negatively reacted to the singer's attitude. Wes, what is your Wes then threw a fit. Why don't you guys go beat the fuck out of these motherfuckers and fuck all this shit up? He then walked off stage. This incident seemed a little bit more clear to me. Wes could not take the negative criticism of the crowd. He instead chose to be pouty over a microphone stand. He was putting the blame on the venue, but the crowd was frustrated at him for not respecting the venue. He could have continued the show with the stand no problem. Wes has lived the most miserable years of his entire life. His reputation by this point was well known by the world. On September 10th, 2017, Wes was arrested for the latest time trying to board a plane with a BB gun. Following this, Scantlin spent three months in solitary confinement. He decided to go to rehab and quit drinking alcohol. A major issue for Wes Scantlin. Let's talk about their album, Welcome to Galvania, The Return of Wes Scantlin.
Galvania wouldn't come out until two years from 2017, but that didn't stop the band from performing the tracks prior to the release, which most bands do. This is another incentive for going to live concerts. The term Galvania is a derivative of the word galvanize, or to shock and excite. Scantlin would actually use the word from a lesson on something called GSR, galvanic skin response. Ever listen to a track you enjoy so much it stimulates you to the point of goosebumps? This is GSR. This title was rather against my expectations after Jacket on the Rack. Thus, Welcome to Galvania was spawned. The album was to explore all the detriment incidents of Wes's career, exploring ideas that he had already had, just with different light. Let's talk about their 2019 release, Welcome to Galvania, and the other things Wes was up to since then, including that poor Nirvana cover. The album is one of those next-gen style records. You no longer have a plastic metric balance case, we now have those foldable cardboard carcasses. The image quality is tremendous, however, I don't like the pockets, because it has no security to the record and the booklet. If it falls out into the opposing side, it makes it harder to close and it could possibly damage the wares. The lyric book is pretty plain, but I'm grateful that we finally get an outer glow on that text. The only key detail I notice on the case is the definition of galvania being an adjective, a change in the electrical resistance of the skin. The album would start off with the track You Don't Know, which was the song, as you guessed it, from the original EP, but at least they credited Jimmy Allen this time. Uh-oh would be their earliest single, and this would be released on July 12, 2019. Girl, This, to me, was the most popular song on the album. This was listing off many of his experiences in life, including the arrests, fights, and being too fucked up to remember any of it. And while a lot of these songs display some growth, the album also had tracks like Go To Hell. This is a little controversial, guys, I'm really sorry, but to me, Go To Hell was an offensive twist on Wes's Christian views, which honestly, I'm not the person to bash people for what they believe in, as long as it's not backed by hate. But I kind I want to briefly mention the line Everybody's dying to get to heaven But most of you only got to go to hell I don't like this line because it implies that literally most of us are going to hell. Like, what the fuck did I do? It is cool to see a nice guitar solo in this track, though. Disease Almost is a fan favorite. It explores some new sounds for the band. This album explores his addiction with alcohol, describing it as the poison, saying that the poison is killing me. I was not only surprised by all the new sounds being explored, but I was also delighted to hear these words from Scantlin, a man who was riddled with addiction consuming him. My Kinda Crazy was a love song, um, so was Just Tell Me. Uh, Time of Our Lives is kinda like one, but I feel like it's more of a nostalgia trip of Wes remembering the good times with an ex-companion. All in all, Welcome to Galvania was an alright album. I was surprised to admit that there was finally growth in their music. It didn't feel like every song was predictable and plain. Wes's lyrics seemed more comprehensive, but not really revelating. The Small Puddle of Mud fanbase generally welcomed a new album by the band, but if you don't like Puddle of Mud, you probably still wouldn't like Puddle of Mud after listening to this record. But as a comeback album, this was much more than admissible. On July 25th, 2017, the band band was live in Doncaster, England, a year after being booed off stage. But this incident, we would see a Wes Scantlin first. He apologized. Last year, I fucked it all up, man. Sorry about that. I don't even remember it, man. We do! I don't even, I don't remember. You know, you guys should try to go over and uh, fight with the fucking soldiers, man. <laughs> That shit is he then began to start playing the song, Uh Oh. To me, the most powerful part of this video is near the end.
Wes's mic was not functioning properly, and Wes did not let this get to him this time. A small gesture with a bigger message. 2018 would be a relatively calm year for Scantlin. He simply toured and had many moments that showed he was slowly picking up his pieces. During an interview with Rock Titan uploaded on July 9th, 2018, Scotty J wanted to show him a Sylvester Stallone quote. And I want to show you a little clip. So we're going to cut away to a little clip here because I really want to touch on some of what you've been going through personally and why I'm personally so proud of you is I know a lot of your fans are. You down with that? Yeah, man. All right. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. You're better than How awesome yeah, is that, dude? dude? Right? Yeah, right. Right? So I just... Well, I, I, Thanks a lot, dude. I wanted you to see that because for me, personally, I'm thinking, well, shoot, man. That's what my man was from Puddle of Mud has yeah. kind of been dealing with. Yeah, you right. know, I mean... The interview itself is worth checking out. Yeah, okay. That's when, when your brain scrambled, other scrambly things are happening around you. People okay. are taking advantage of you and uh, right. so now that I'm all better and clean and sober it's like I gotta go redo everything you okay. know right. by myself all right. But in on December 2nd, 2018, Wes Scantlin would perform on stage with his son Jordan. Uh, I thought it was about you, huh? All right then, let's go ahead and kick it, big dog. This was a very heartfelt incident. 2019, Wes would continue sobriety. Wes would do an interview with Kerrang posted on October 24th, 2019. The interview explained his sobriety, the stole your house incident, and the baggage carousel incident. These are three questions from that interview. Because you've been sober for over two years now, how difficult was that to do? And what prompted that decision? Well, if you ever saw anything in the press, my entire house was stolen from me. I had 40 Gibson Les Paul stolen for me. All my memorabilia from playing all the shows for the soldiers and stuff in the last 10 years of war. Basically, I just had everything stolen from me in my life. There's the famous video clip of you at a gig where you point to a guy near the front of the crowd that, it, that you accuse of stealing your house. Yeah, my house was basically stolen. It was mailbox fraud. I wasn't in town. I was actually on tour the whole time. And I came back and there was a barbed wire fence around my house. But I definitely like to turn negatives into positives in my life and have optimistic awesome beliefs that there is light at the end of the tunnel and don't give up. Never give up ever. Even though all that lost has happened, I've gained probably at least 500 million more percent of positivity in my life. But your whole life has been like that. Like getting arrested for going on a luggage conveyor belt at an airport. Obviously security nowadays is tight at, at airports, but it's still such an odd thing to get arrested for. What happened with that? And what's on the other side? There's really nothing going on back there. It was just a couple of freaking baggage carousel guys guys. They were playing cards. I didn't actually mean to go out of bounds. It was just a dare. People dare me to do things and I'm a daredevil or a dare angel anyway. So they don't like that very much, but it's all water under the bridge now. But sometimes ignorance can be bliss. Despite sobriety, Wes was going to become the center of attention once again in 2020. Let's talk about his Nirvana cover. In January of 2020, Wes featured live on Sirius XM covering a Nirvana song about a girl. This was not the first time the band covers this song, but this was the first time it was happening in a studio. During every end of a line, Wes would pitch his voice in such a tone that almost rips your good music receptors. You hang me out to try. I can see you every the lyrics become borderline incoherent at times. This performance would evolve into dozens of memes thus mocking him. Wes would have to face up to that fact. His response was on Instagram and he stated, Rise above others who try and take you down. I'm at my best now and that's all that matters. I pray for you all because we care. Jealousy is toxic and toxic people are a waste of time. We walk away with nothing but a smile, with a bunch of hashtags following it. SiriusXM removed the video from their YouTube page. 
Wes's response was not really all that sincere. It actually kind of seemed rather passive aggressive. This response does not prove that Wes is more respectful to criticism following his sobriety. That Wes is jumping the gun, labeling criticism as toxic and that it shouldn't be reasoned with. The internet ripped this video apart. Many comments and jokes were backed with hundreds, sometimes thousands of likes insulting the man for the abysmal act. And this is on a re-upload. This wasn't the only cringy video I found. On April 24, 2020, the band page would upload this really cringy clip called Wes Scantlin and Kurt Cobain Talk It Out. I messed it up again. <laughs> Uh-oh. Not a big deal, dude. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Everybody thinks we look alike anyway. The clip reminds me of a skit from CN's Mad. You guys have to remember, Wes is a 48-year-old man, and this was greenlit by him. Must have been a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> as an apology f for his bad cover. They made three episodes of this following it. The most recent, encouraging people to vote, which I mean, the intent is there. Many people would claim this video as worse than the Sirius XM cover. From Puddle of Mud, sitting chilling at home, as usual, you know, uh, quarantined. We're not gonna be able to tour anytime soon. You know, there, there's gonna be a solution, I guarantee it. And uh, we can get back to doing what we do and, uh, you know, get back to uh, having some fun and rocking and rolling and, uh, you know, we're all number one. Music throughout the 2010s has evolved in such a way that greatly changed the tastes of the general audience. As time went on, popular genres such as hard rock became much more niche. The term butt rock would be used to describe the basic minimalistic characteristics that is found in post-grunge and other genres. The history can go back to Soundgarden's Matt Cameron in 1994, where he described butt rock as stupid basic three chord rock. The qualifications of labeling something as butt rock is still rather subjective. Butt rock is a play on the word butt head thus perceiving it in a negative view. This would be a label put under bands that would be seen as despised, due to many reasons, to include but not limited to the lack of creativity, edginess, poor taste, simplicity, and passion that can be found within their music. This would include bands like Five Finger Death Punch, Disturbed, Nickelback, Butt Cherry, and it would also include bands that I actually enjoy, like Three Days Grace, Seether, and Breaking Benjamin, to be seen as butt rock. But I feel this term is rather biased, cause while some of these bands are overplayed on the radio and may not deserve their popularity, it's kind of a hateful term that someone would use as stereotyping a specific genre that they don't like, which could be accompanied with a claim that their music taste is better when it really shouldn't be about that. Music shouldn't be a debate on which artist is better, it should be about the emotional connection a listener can have with an artist. Wes Scantlin was a believer in this. We're ready to uh, bring the love and the rock, man, you know? He believed that his intent in music was to heal others even at his lowest points in life. Wes, however, was no genius. He was a simple dude that made simple music. Puddle of Mud is no white ward or have a nice life, but they were a band that played a part in my childhood growing up. That exposure made me not mind listening to some of their work. I typically enjoy seeing growth in artists, but Puddle of Mud throughout the 2000s and 2010s showed that the growth of the band was halted by the poor decisions made by Wes. This could have made their record records less appealing to the general audience. As I mentioned from the beginning, the perspectives on Wes Scantlin are divided. There is a side that despises Wes for his past decisions. Some would believe that even after sobriety, he still somehow makes an ass of himself. This side could see Wes's actions as attention-seeking to stir up the pot to attract more attention to the band. With this came his victim card that Wes played throughout his life to lie to himself that all of his problems are external. To top things off, Wes can come across as having a cynical sense of humor that makes him look apathetic to others' emotions. Wes would have moments of anger that would make him passive-aggressive towards others that he thinks did him wrong. This has led him into hot water to the point where society saw him as a deadbeat that was lost in the sauce. The other side, however, shed a more positive, forgiving perspective. Throughout all the Wes Scantlin incidents, he was always defended by his peers. Jimmy Allen defended him after him not being credited by Wes. 
Wes, Paul defended Wes during several interviews, and those weren't the only people moved by Wes. Interviewers from all over the country admired Wes for overcoming his vices and mistakes. These people don't care about what the haters of Wes think. They simply choose to forgive Wes of letting the rock and roll lifestyle consume him. That even after all of his mistakes, they will be there for him, loving him for who he is. Which in all honesty, I kind of believe that Wes was in some sense right about the media's perspective on him. They didn't see him as a man that needed help, they saw him as a bunch of dollar signs for them to exploit for their own benefit. While Scantlin has been sober for about three years, there's still one problem I have with Wes. His issues of criticism. Before we get into that, there are two things about Wes that stood consistent. His love for his son, and his love for God. His relationship with God helped Wes seek help when he was in solitary confinement for three months. His relationship with God has positively benefited Scantlin to the point where if, if he never had it in the first place, Scantlin might not be with us today. However, religion is controversial due to how powerful we believe in what we believe in. Some can't fathom the idea that someone else could have a different belief system. Wes's relationship in God, as shown in his music, can alienate the people that aren't of that faith. In his Instagram post, it almost seemed Wes might look down on others that don't see things his way. Who's to say if Wes has turned a new leaf? This all just happened not even a few years ago. We still have a very long time for that answer to be truly fulfilled. Wes could not handle the negative criticism, instead he chose to reflect that poorly. He was an individual that blamed his misfortune on factors not of his control. He seemed he was a man that followed his dream and didn't care who he would step over to get there. By the time he got there, he neglected his fortune and lacked to find growth in himself. Whoever had to go to a show and see these tantrums have a right to be frustrated towards Wes. They were personally affected by his actions and there's nothing that anyone can do to change that. But while Wes did lose a significant, if not majority, of his fans that were exposed to his actions, he still had many loyal fans that defended his music as something that moved them, and I guess I can respect that. Let me finalize my perspective. I started listening to music in high school as a way to vent my frustrating emotions that came with growing up. I used to listen to the soundtracks of video games and would explore new bands through them. I ended up enjoying a lot of bands that many people would judge me for liking. And honestly, that's something that will always exist in music. As I've gotten older, I've been exposed to new bands and genres that I've never even heard of. I saw the value that can be found in any genre of music. And that's the connection between the band and the listener. If you feel that connection with the artist, embrace it. Don't let the thoughts of others prevent you from embracing that. Personally, I don't believe we should be overly judgmental over another's music taste. Music is an outlet that has been proven to benefit our health. If someone enjoys listening to hated bands like Nickelback, ICP, and Coldplay, they are in their right to enjoy it just as much as they're in their right to hate it. Music since the discovery of the internet has evolved in a way in which bands with little to no popularity can be much more accessible to the general public. Anyone nowadays can create and spread their music project with ease. Bands like Puddle of Mud existed in a period where a main source of music came from MTV and the radio. I believe Puddle of Mud declined due to a lack of growth that was found within Wes Scantlin. Combined with the growing stigma that Wes Scantlin was a train wreck with no control over his issues. But also, I think this just isn't enough for me to hate Wes. At the end of the day, I see him as only human. A lot of people would insist that I be angry over Scantlin for his decisions. And if I can't hate like they do, I'm evil too. Wes had many moments in his life that I did not agree with. I did not agree with the Dolly McCarthy interview. I did not agree with the Gin Mill concert incident. But his intentions as an artist I respect. We all make mistakes. We all have emotions. We all get angry. We all have our moments where we go too far. But that's what makes us human. Addiction is not the greatest thing to overcome. Even after understanding all the amount of information on Wes, I still don't know my exact feelings on the man. And honestly, I don't blame anybody who disagrees with me. I don't blame the people who despise Wes, and I don't blame the people that defend Wes. Let's be honest, he himself is a man flooded in controversy. With controversy comes arguing. Maybe in time, I will truly understand my feelings on the matter. But till then, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please check out the playlist in the description below. As toxic, toxicity, toxic, toxic, 
toxic toxicity toxic toxicity and that it shouldn't be reasoned with i'm paul and this is wes don't worry about all mud any advice for up-and-coming musicians uh practice really really hard don't listen to your parents did you have the steins did you use the steins yeah we use the steins and we go out on the sailboats and flip them over on purpose and we would have like pirate wars and just be complete idiots <laughs> around this world and came back, you know, and all of a sudden this whole thing went down. And uh, mm -hmm. it's like. What's up, Wes? What's going on, man? What's so, up? What happened, dude? Well, the camera was chucked at my head. Oh, cool. This is a camera that's chucked at my fucking head. I don't know what they did, man. It hurts.